Laboratory problem number one is a plain stress case. This is a square sheet of aluminum. It has a hole in the middle, and it's pulled upon by edge loads. I'll start out by showing the physical problem statement, and then we'll consider the various assumptions made in the physical modeling. Next, we'll look at the finite element modeling involved, such as the type of element to be used, the number of elements, and so on. I will present data sets for three different commercial finite element programs for MSC Nastran, MARC, and ASTROS. We'll show the results and compare the codes with each other. Lastly, I'll show a commercial quality solution that will have a much finer mesh. The sheet of material is one meter by one meter in plan by one millimeter thick. The hole has a diameter of 300 millimeters and it's centered. The external stress is 100 megapascals acting on these two vertical sides. Of course, the question here is how the stress pattern will flow around the hole. Our problem lies in a plane, and we'll denote it as the XY plane. The loading also lies in the plane. The material is thin, and the stress is normal to that plane will be negligible. So as a result, we have plane stress. We won't consider buckling, even though that would be possible for such thin sheet material. And indeed, you can get compressive regions in thin material when it's pulled. You often see this in the form of wrinkling on wrapping materials like thin polyethylene sheet material. The material is assumed linear and elastic and with Young's modulus corresponding to aluminum Poisson's ratio of 3 tenths. We will consider strains to be infinitesimal so that linear elastic theory applies. Now that means that the forces that I've applied have to be small enough not to drive this system into a nonlinear region. So we have to check that at the end of the problem. Now, from previous work, we really would expect there to be high tensile forces at the top and the bottom of the hole. And were this a doubly infinite sheet of material, we'd expect that to have a stress concentration factor of plus 3. Similarly, we would expect a stress concentration factor of minus 1 on the horizontal axis. These are classical results that are exact and done from analytical theory. Now, our problem is finite in extent, and the stress field will be flowing through this narrowed region, and therefore should, in fact, cause a higher stress concentration factor than the three that we we're suggesting as a rough answer. So far, this problem has been posed as a stress boundary value problem. We've been given finite stresses on two boundaries and zero stresses on the other boundaries. But we can change the problem into a different type by exploiting the geometric symmetry and material symmetry and loading symmetry about the vertical plane going through the center of the hole and the horizontal plane. So there really are these two reflective planes of symmetry. By cutting out the first quadrant then and imposing symmetric boundary conditions on the vertical and the horizontal cut portions of the body, we have cut our problem size down to one quarter of the original size. As a side feature, we also then are going to apply some boundary conditions on displacement that are going to remove the rigid body modes. They convert what was originally a stress boundary value problem into a mixed boundary value problem where some stress-like and some displacement-like things are prescribed. Now, a reflective plane of symmetry, in this case, acts a lot like a greased surface or a ball-bearing surface. For instance, on this vertical plane, uh, the symmetric condition is that there be zero vertical shear force on that cut plane and that there be zero horizontal displacement at that cut plane. 
and that's similar to what a grease surface would have where the uh, sheet metal would be forced to maintain contact with that surface but could slide up and down it. And then the same conditions hold uh, on this horizontal plane of symmetry, namely zero displacement normal to that plane and zero force along the plane, along that cut plane. Now that we've posed the physical problem, we have to do our finite element modeling. I'm going to propose a very simple model with just two elements of a quad eight type. Some codes only have four noted plate and shell elements, and then you would need perhaps eight quad four elements to get the job done. That's how we'll solve the problem with the Astros code, for instance. Now in the Nastran series, there is a quad eight element, which is basically a shell element, but we would only use the in-plane stresses for that element as results. The mark code, uh, which might be typical of others, has special plane stress elements, so we use an eight-noted plane stress element for mark. So no matter what your particular code at your own um, installation is, uh, you need to pick an element that would model the in-plane part of the stress field. Rather universally, the degrees of freedom in a finite element problem are numbered 1 through 6, where 1, 2, and 3 are translations, 4, 5, and 6 are rotations about those same x, y, z axes. In our problem, since this is to be plane stress, we're only interested in the one and two coordinate directions. We can therefore constrain the degrees of freedom three, four, five, and six, uh, and save some computer time. That isn't necessary, but it will help simplify the solution. So notice on this figure that I've applied the displacement boundary conditions, which are to be to constrain degrees of freedom one on these nodes on the vertical reflective plane, and to constrain degrees of freedom two, or the y direction, on the horizontal reflective plane. Now, since we don't mention the forces on those external nodes, those forces are by default set to zero. And that gives us the other part of the reflective symmetric boundary condition. So we get that by default. Now, the live loads are shown in red. And these are consistent with a parabolic uh, sh shape function in the interior of the element. So these are equivalent nodal loads. And you can show that from energy methods. Currently, we don't have the theory for that, but we'll show that in a few lectures and convince you that this is the best way to apportion the loads when the element can move with a parabolic displacement field. For the one code that is going to use linear elements, or at least so-called bilinear displacement functions, which is the Astros code, we're going to use quad fours, then we'll go back to a linear apportionment of these uh, forces, and it will be in a little bit different pattern. Our first data set is for MSC Nastran. We use two quad eight shell elements for our model, and the numbering is down in the order First for the vertices, A, B, C, and D. And then following that, the midsides, E, F, G, and H. And the E has to come between the A and B as shown. So you start off the midside nodes uh, in the same order that you did the vertex numbering. Now, Nastran data has three basic components. You have executive control statements, and you have case control commands, and you have bulk data entries. Those are all mandatory. And in addition, you can have some introductory cards that are optional. Here I'm showing an assignment to bring some data out of Nastran through the channel called Output 2 and to be entered into a file, p1.f12. This is going to be the post-processing information. Later we'll set a parameter that will allow this to be read by Patran. Uh, 
and uh, in other lab problems we use ideas. Now the executive control statements are more along the line of the big picture. Uh, the identification of the problem, setting a time, asking for a solver. Now SAW 101 is the modern static solver, the linear static solver. And then you end this section with the C and card. Now let's look at the case control command. Here we put a title, plain stress. Uh, we ask that both the raw data that we are printing in here and the sorted data be echoed back in the printout. Now, basically, the sorted data is done alphabetically and is a little more of a universal way to check your uh, data entry because uh, everybody's data in the world then will be sorted alphabetically so you know how to help a friend because you know where to look for things. So, uh, at some point, you may uh, get rid of the echoing back of the raw data by just saying sort here instead of echo, S-O-R-T. The um, NASTRAN program requires that you ask for things. This list of information to come out, uh, we're asking for displacements, for stresses, uh, element forces, and SPC forces. Now these are the so-called single point constraint forces. I find them very useful to help on determining whether you have a well-posed physical problem because you want your reaction forces, which these are, to balance the live loads, and it's a good check. Displacements, of course, you would think you might always want, but not clear. In a really, really large structure like a nuclear reactor, you might not want them. Likewise, stresses, not clear. You want all stresses everywhere. And so if you're puzzled by the fact that you have to ask for output, uh, remember that the NASTRAN family of codes has been set up for really, really large problems. And it is possible to run it and get no output at all unless you ask for it. With the reason being that people want to avoid having a truck roll up with a whole semi-trailer full of computer output on the, say, the stresses in your entire aircraft carrier or your entire uh, nuclear plant. Um, then you can use subcases within NASTRAN, and these are very useful. You can even change boundary conditions within the subcase level. That helps you solve problems with reflective planes that have both symmetric and anti-symmetric loading, because then you need to have symmetric and anti-symmetric boundary conditions and sum up those results. And that's all rather well automated within the uh, MSC NASTRAN program. Uh, we will use only one subcase and uh, give an arbitrary number of 50 for our load case, and that's corresponding to our 100 megapascal edge loading. Now we go into the bulk data, and at the outset you can set some parameters. And by the way, these need not be in any particular order. The bulk data can be in any order that you'd like. There was a criterion put in years ago when it was card format that the deck of cards could be dropped on the floor and re-entered in random order and the uh, program would be able to handle that. I do show as a personal preference the parameter cards up front when your interest is still great before you get overloaded with grid and element information. And the so-called automatic single point constraint uh, feature will constrain any degrees of freedom that have not been given stiffness and will allow a solution then of a rather pathological problem. So for training purposes it's kind of good to turn this on because then the solution will proceed to the end more likely. But beware because you also increase the possibility of a bad solution by letting it solve a problem that has a hole in it or some degrees of freedom floating around in space. This is our request for graphical output and it will come out uh, as a file with the extension .f12 for the PATRAN post processor. If you use minus two, then you get the 
ideas post-processor information. The grid set card imposes default values on the fields that follow and a particularly useful default is that if you don't say otherwise in this field, which is the eighth field, to say that you want to constrain degrees of freedom three, four, five, and six. And that's what turns our problem into a plain stress problem. Now let's look at our grid locations. I have some 13 grids called out here. And in each case, there's a number that uh, identifies the grid by number. The third field shown in this um, free format is a default blank, and that will default to the basic coordinate system, which is a right-handed rectangular coordinate system. Then you give the three co components here, the x, y, and z components in that coordinate system. There follows another field that's another default in this case, but could have been set to another coordinate system to be used for intermediate calculations and for printing data out. In the eighth field, we have the permanent embedded single point constraint list, and this would replace the default value that the grid set card mentioned earlier would have imposed. So on the vertical reflective plane, we bring in these constraints where the, the one has to do with constraining the x displacement, and then the three, four, five, six make it a two-dimensional problem. Notice that we don't um, override the default on this uh, field in the remaining interior cards, and so we do get the default there. On the horizontal reflective plane, we do something similar, but we constrain the number two degree of freedom, which is the Y displacement, and then we add the um, constraints needed for two-dimensional problems. Now that you have your grids all located, now you can do the connectivities for the elements. There's a connectivity card, a C quad eight, uh, identifying the first element. It, in turn, refers to a P shell card or a property card that's on the next figure, not on this one. And then you give the location, uh, that is the ordering of the nodes that are at the vertices, and then the mid-side nodes. Now, they run over to the next line here on a continuation line, and we have a symbol here that lets you know that the line is to be continued. In fact, the plus is the key here in both the first column of this tenth field as well as the first column of the first field on the continuation line. Sometimes this is called the parent card or image, and this is called the child. And if you leave out one of these or the other, the uh, Nastran program will yell at you and say, hey, there's an orphan child. Our second quad element uses the same property card, and that can be a convenience because, as you would expect, then you could change a whole bunch of elements' properties just by making one entry change in the P shell card. Now, as promised, we'll look at the P shell card next. And here it is. Uh, it was referred to under its own ID 29. And then it, in turn, refers to a material card, a MAT1 card 13, which is down here. Now, the relevant property of such a shell element is the thickness shown here. Everything that we're doing is in terms of millimeters, newtons, and megapascals. And um, codes such as MSC Nastran typically do not have physical constants embedded that carry dimensions. And so it's up to the user to use a consistent set of units. All right, our material card in turn has Young's modulus 
uh, then a blank for the shear modulus, and then Poisson's ratio. Finally, on our bulk data set, we have the forces defined. This was called the load case 50 and was referred to back in the case control section. Then this gives the node that's being acted upon a coordinate system, a multiplying constant, and then the X, Y, and Z components. That's done in turn for the three nodes that are on the right-hand boundary with our equivalent nodal loads shown here. And they're rather unevenly distributed. Notice that they're in the ratio of 1 to 4 to 1. It's a little surprising, but that's the way it works out from an energy standpoint when you have parabolic shape functions. Well, the final card is N data spelled with two Ds. Beware of that. And so this constitutes our data set, everything above. Currently, the way such a code would be run, and, and I do it on my workstation, is to take this data set and then transmit it to perhaps a larger machine somewhere and have the problem run. The analysis program uh, will look for a data set that has extension .dat, will do the calculations, will put out a kind of a log under a .fo4 extension. It will give the complete printout under .fo6, and will give the graphical results under .f12. Now, when you look at the F06 file, which I'm showing here, you, one of the first interesting pieces of information that you see in there is a user information message. And it will give a quantity called epsilon, and this is a measure of error in the solution. They take the unbalance in force at a node and divide it by the magnitude of the forces. And basically, this tells you how many significant figures you have remaining. Now, our machines work with in the order of 16 significant figures, so we've hardly lost any um, precision by the calculations themselves. And we have remaining something on the order of 15 significant figures. The external work that's done is found by the analysis program by multiplying forces through the distances that they move. And you want to check that and make sure that it's not a, an exceedingly large number. If it is, you might have what's called a mechanism where one of the nodes is moving rather freely and then the applied load moves to really large distances. But our answer of something like 20,000 newton millimeters seems like a reasonable number for our size of problem. So therefore, both of these information messages seem to indicate a reasonable solution. Most of us using computer terminals or workstations at our desk are able to look at the result file electronically without getting a hard copy. No matter how you do it, whether you look at it electronically on the screen or whether you get hard copy, you probably should be looking at displacements, stresses, and forces of single point constraint. Let's start with displacement vector here. And when we do, we see that the largest displacement is on the horizontal axis under the load at node 13. And the displacement is 1.13 millimeters, which is not a, uh, an unreasonable deflection. There is a Y displacement that is the highest of the Y displacements. And this is like a Poisson's ratio contraction up at the top boundary on node 3, which is on the uh, vertical reflective plane. So the body tends to expand and in the x direction and then contract in the y direction, much as in a Poisson's ratio contraction. Now let's look at the stresses in the two elements. Here we have the sigma x, the sigma y, and then the major and minor principal stresses and the von Mises stresses. 
Now, I do abridge the results in order to fit it onto these pages, and so the form that you're seeing is not precisely the form written out by MSC Nastran. Uh, one thing I do often is suppress the fact that these are conventional grid points rather than scalar points, so I remove that information. Secondly, on our plane stress problem, we really don't care if we're uh, plus 0.5 or minus 0.5 millimeters from the um, neutral surface. In this case, I've cut out the stresses on the other uh, side of the body. So we just look at plus 0.5 millimeters. Now let's concentrate on the principal stresses. And we find that the maximum tensile stress is at um, element number one at grid one, which is the top of the hole. And it actually gives a stress concentration factor of 2.74 compared with the uniform applied stress of 100 megapascals. Uh, also, the uh, most negative stress is minus 95 megapascals, and that occurs at, at grid point 11, which is um, on the horizontal reflective plane on the, uh, on the diameter of the hole, and that's a stress concentration factor then of 0.95. Now, both of those numbers fall a little short of the 3 and 1 that we expected for a doubly infinite body, and therefore they'll even be um, uh, in error more so for our finite body, which ought to have higher stress concentrations yet. A very useful diagnostic for a finite element run uh, is the list of single point constraint forces. And the reason is that those forces ought to react to live loading on the system. Here are the MSC Nastran forces of constraint, and those that lie on the vertical reflective plane at grid points 1, 2, and 3 are shown here. Those do add up to oppose the live load of 50,000 newtons. On the horizontal reflective plane, grids 11, 12, 13, we have these SPC forces here, and they add up to zero. So uh, that's why you have some positive and some negative terms. Now, I won't discuss these further, but we'll defer until we get a composite picture where we can compare the three different commercial codes. Now let's switch to a different code and look at the data entry for the MARC code. Here we have access to an eight-noted quadrilateral. It's numbered in the same way as the NASTRAN uh, connectivity was numbered, A, B, C, D, and then the mid-side nodes E, F, G, H. The fact that it's actually a plane stress element means that it's been specialized for the in-plane problem. Now, in the MARC code, you can either use free format or the rigid format. Rigid format is used for this first set of uh, information. The title, you can have these as many as you want, fields of 10 here for the word title, and then the uh, comments following, which appear on the various forms of output. Sizing, we're asking for 400,000 words of uh, memory, high-speed memory. This isn't so appropriate, probably, if you have a dedicated workstation. Um, element type, we're having element type 26, which is our eight-noted plane stress element. And that's the end of the uh, introductory information. The next figure will show a number of control cards for Mark. Here we have commands for post-processing. And these include information on what stresses are expected to be printed out. And in particular, these numbers here have to do with the six components of stress and then the von Mises stress, number 17. Now, I wanted to compare nodal stresses with those from MSC Nastran, so I put in this list where uh, we're going to print nodal information. Uh, we have one such list of information involving uh, the 
total set of stresses and loads and reactions, and, and then uh, this gives us nodal stresses for uh, the nodes 1 to 13. So this is helpful in our comparison with the uh, MSC Nastran code. Then for loads, we're asking for point loads. There are to be three of those defined following. And the loads are set here for the, um, on the different nodes. There's this 8,300 Newton load that acts on node 8, the 33,000 one that acts on node 10, and the 8,000 one acting on 13. We're calling this arbitrarily a load with ID uh, number 67. At the bottom of the previous figure um, was the start of the information for the single point constraint list, and there were to be several sets of those. They're actually shown here now that we're constraining with zero um, displacement in coordinate direction two, those grids 11, 12, and 13. That's the vertical, no, oh, sorry, that's the horizontal axis of reflective symmetry. Then we constrain with displacement zero, degree of freedom one, which is x direction on the vertical reflective plane. Connectivities follow what we uh, have laid out that there are two elements to follow here. Element one uh, of type 26, and then the uh, vertices, and then the uh, mid-side nodes. Coordinates involve, in general, six coordinate degrees of freedom, and there are 13 coordinates to follow, and they're given the x and y coordinates here. The next figure continues the set of coordinates for the nodes. And here's our remaining coordinates. Then we have the material information, isotropic, and uh, there's just one set of such um, lines. A, we're calling it material number 13. We're giving a Young's modulus and a Poisson's ratio, and this applies to elements one and two. Geometry, we have one case involved, and that's a unit thickness in millimeters that applies to elements one to two. And that's the end of our data set. Now, in some nonlinear problems, uh, which is beyond our interest, you could have further cards that would uh, control the iterative process and the incremental process. And you might have cards that would say control and other things here. And then the last card might be a continue card that would let that loop through some incremental process. But in our linear problem, we don't need that. Let's look at the forces of constraint now that have been calculated by a mark run. Here we get the forces on the first uh, three nodes, which are on the vertical reflective plane. And these are legitimate reaction forces needed to hold those points fixed on that reflective plane. These other numbers that follow then are merely an error measure and uh, show a little bit about the unresolved forces at a given node. So that would play the role of uh, a precision measure again in terms perhaps of how many significant figures. If you compare the re size of this reaction force here to the size of the unresolved forces at the grid, you'll get some idea of how many significant figures you have. You can see that ratio is pretty high. It's 10 to the 16th or 15th or something again. Then um, the um, reaction here in the y direction at the uh, nodes 11, 12, and 13 is also significant. It will turn out that these will add up to zero because there's no net vertical force on that body since the live loads are horizontal.
and those do add up properly, as do these here to equal the applied load of some uh, 50,000 newtons to the right. We then pick up minus 50,000 newtons to the left. And now we'll check our displacement field. The maximum displacement that we get with Mark is shown here as uh, 1.086 millimeters. And that's at node 13 in the horizontal direction. The Poisson ratio contraction causes this 0.44 millimeters at node 3. Uh, and it's negative. In other words, the body is uh, contracting uh, downward at that point. We also look at the stress field to see what sort of stress concentration factors that we obtain. And by the way, we aren't taking these stresses too seriously because we know this is an academic problem with only two elements. Uh, nevertheless, it's interesting how well the codes do. Uh, 274 megapascals for the maximum uh, extraction stress at node 1, which is at the top of the hole. Uh, giving a stress concentration factor of 2.74. Then the compressive load of minus 69 uh, on the horizontal bore of the hole, uh, giving stress concentration factor of 0.69 and showing the compressive part of the uh, problem. Now let's look at the Astros data set. These are generally compatible with the cosmic Nastran, so if you are interested in cosmic Nastran, you can follow this pretty closely. Um, what I've done is to use eight quad four elements here, and uh, that's going to be a slightly different technology. The stresses are given at the element centroids, shown as red dots. And so this time we're not going to be able to compare as accurately with the uh, MSC Nastran and the MARC results, which are at the corner nodes. But we'll, nevertheless, it fills out a stress pattern, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we've had to add interior nodes 14 and 15 then, which didn't appear in the other simple model. So we now have 15 nodes. The data for this problem are shown in the next figure for Astros. Um, these lines are called solution control data. And uh, there's an assignment of a database, a uh, request for a solution, titles given. And here we have the commands to analyze and uh, boundary, statics, label, print. I guess the print is interesting because, again, we need to ask for displacements, stresses, SPC forces, and then element forces. The bulk data are the same as for MSC Nastran, and uh, we'll go through this briefly. The grid set card is useful for imposing default conditions on the problem. In particular, when you have a plain stress problem, such as we are uh, studying here, you may want to constrain all of the unneeded degrees of freedom. So unless you say differently, then the eighth field will have these numbers 3, 4, 5, 6 embedded. Now, when you write out your grid locations here. Grid 1 is given uh, a coordinate system by default to be 0 here, which is the basic Cartesian underlying system. Then you write the x, y, and z coordinates for that node. You have a chance for a second coordinate system here in which your results can be printed out and in which you can do certain intermediate calculations. But when you come to the field where you put what are called permanent embedded single point constraints, then since we override the default in order to get uh, the reflective boundary condition that uh, there should be no x displacement, we also have to add the other 
um, constraints because once you've overridden the default, you aren't going to get part of them back. In fact, there would be no way for the program to anticipate which part of that default you wanted and which part you didn't want. Uh, now, this default up here will, in fact, though, apply to all the intermediate nodes shown here. And so that will bring our problem into a two-dimensional problem status. So um, we've added the final two interior grids here at uh, grid points 14 and 15. Um, the grid set, uh, sorry, the grid definition is pretty straightforward, I would say. Next, we'll define the quad four element connectivities. And again, we have this uh, triad where you have a connectivity card that points to a property card that points to a material card. And that allows rather efficient change of your structure, whether you're changing a material or a thickness of a shell, that you can make that change with relatively few changes to the data. Now, the first quad, for instance, points to property 23 down below here. It has connectivity 1, 4, 14, and 2, which you can see from the uh, mesh that we showed earlier is a proper um, way to connect. Now, there's no worry about whether these are clockwise or co counterclockwise, typically, because if they're plate elements, they would normally be embedded in three dimensions. So uh, you can do those, uh, you know, depending how you build your structure, you could be looking at those plates from either side. So there's uh, no uh, preferred uh, direction of the way that you enter those, except they have to be consecutive around the vertices. All right, in the P-shell card, uh, we refer then to a material card, which I'll draw a triangle here, is here. The only uh, entry on the property card is the thickness of the shell at one millimeter. In the material card, you have Young's modulus, and then the shear modulus left blank, and then the Poisson's ratio, because you only need to give two of the three isotropic elastic constants. The forces are given here, uh, our load case 67 with forces on grid points 8, 10, and 13. We're using our basic coordinate system with a load factor of 1. And in this case, we're using the linear distribution of forces. So these are equivalent nodal loads here based on linear shape functions, or at least what you call bilinear in the quad element. Uh, that is, the function will be linear on any side any straight line side. And there are no uh, Y nor Z components. Then you end your data set with the word end data, spelling it with two Ds. Let's look at the Astros displacements now. The X displacements are given here, and the largest X displacement is at node 13, as we expect and it's 1.097 millimeters. That's just a bit less than the NAS trans solution and a tiny bit more than the Mark solution. The vertical displacement is the largest at node 3, where the top of the body is contracting by a Poisson's ratio effect, and we get a minus 0.46 millimeters there. The forces of constraint that are obtained from Astros have to be done by going into the database and picking them out. So it is a special function. They're shown here, and the numbers will be put on a figure later for comparison with the other codes, so they don't mean much here. But again, you'll find that if you add these horizontal forces of constraint, that they will directly oppose the live load and then that these forces of constraint on the right here add to zero because there is no live vertical load on that body. Stress is given by the commercial codes very widely. Uh, sometimes the default is the nodal stress, sometimes it's centroidal, sometimes it's at the Gauss points. Now, for the quad four and astros, the centroidal stress is the default that's the most easy to obtain. 
So I'm going to show that here without further massaging the information. And when we do that, we find that the highest stressed element is number one, which is closest to the stress concentration at the top of the hole. And you get 182 megapascals, which is a modest stress concentration measure. Um, on the other hand, the negative contribution um, is minus some 34 megapascals, and so we don't approach the negative stress concentration very closely. I'll show these further on a diagram comparing the different stresses at the end of our uh, data entry uh, figures here. Let's now collect the results from these three simple solutions that we've done for this problem. And of course the answers won't be accurate. They'll just indicate the kind of stresses and displacements and constraint forces that you can get from commercial codes. First, I'll show the mesh for the quad eight elements. And this particular figure was obtained with MSC Nastran and Patran as the post processor. I've added the element numbers myself, so that's not the original form in which they're shown. I'll show the deflected form of the body by using MSC Nastran and Patran. I show the undeformed body. Um, is given with this dashed line and then the deformed body with the solid line. The typical deflections are shown here around a millimeter on this axis and uh, half a millimeter downward on this axis. So you can see how the body has been elongated under the live loads. Then uh, the hole here has gone from this circular shape to an elliptical shape. The forces of single point constraint are summarized in our next figure. I use black for the MSC Nastran results, red for the Mark results, and blue for Astros. Blue probably making sense because it's an Air Force code, right? Into the wild blue yonder. Well, um, the nice thing is that these results are all self-consistent. And that is, if you take the Nastran reaction forces here, they add up to the 50,000 newtons that the live load had um, acted upon on this boundary to the right. Likewise with the Mark and the Astros reactions. If you look at the horizontal reflective plane below here, the same thing happens, that the Nastran results add to zero because there's no live load in that direction, and likewise the Mark and the Astros. Now there's a fair amount of difference in the results, and I would say the Astros results differ more, and the reason is that I'm using eight quad four elements instead of two quad eights. Now both solutions have roughly the same number of degrees of freedom, so um, it's not clear that one should be a lot more accurate than the other, but the way that we did apply the live load on the right edge did make use of either a parabolic or a trapezoidal distribution, and the parabolic distribution tended to lump more of the load at the center node, so that's possibly a reason why these numbers here are a little higher for the Nastran and the Mark codes than the Astros result here, but I wouldn't read too much into these differences. Now let's look at the stress in this body, and I'll use principal stress as a major measure of the stress situation. Actually, the principal stresses uh, correspond with the sigma x and sigma y stresses, uh, the appropriate ones, at the top and the side of the hole where the stress concentrations are highest. So uh, you could also, at that point, interpret these as sigma x and sigma y. Um, I'll show these stresses as they came from the different codes at the location where they are provided. For instance, 